We're continuing our studies in Chapter 9 on Membrane Transport, and our subject for this lesson is Primary and Secondary Active Transport, transport that requires the expenditure of energy. Recall in our previous lessons, we saw examples of facilitated or passive transport. In other words, we were moving things with a gradient. In some cases, those transporters were more selective than others, but it was always with a gradient and therefore it did not require the input of energy. We're going to look at two examples of active transport. In this case, we're moving against a gradient. We're going to look first at the sodium-potassium ATPase transporter. It's called an ATPase because it's an enzyme that hydrolyzes ATP. That's going to be our source of energy to move the ions. Now, this is not the sodium and potassium transporters that we saw in the action potential. Remember, all we did was open the doors in those cases, and the sodium ions moved with their gradients. In this case, we're actually setting up the gradients that we used in that case. We're going to hydrolyze one molecule of ATP, and that will give us enough energy to pump three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions inside the cell. Let's see how that cycle works. It works to a similar rocker mechanism that we saw in the glucose transporter, but remember that was an example of facilitated transport. It didn't cost us any energy, but in this case it does. Here's our transport at the top of the screen here, and you can see that the pore is open to the inside of the cell. We're going to bind three sodium ions. They'll fit perfectly in that little pocket there, and that will trigger the binding of an ATP molecule, and the a uh, transporter rapidly transfers fo a phosphoryl group from ATP to the cytoplasmic domain of the transporter and we release ADP. This transfer of a phosphoryl group is referred to as phosphorylation and that triggers a conformational change and that causes our transporter to rock to the other side. So now our pore is facing the outside of the cell and we release those sodium ions. At the top of the screen here we have our transporter. That pore is facing the outside of the cell and in that position it can readily bind two potassium ions. These are larger ions. If you look at the periodic table you'll notice that potassium is below sodium in that column and that means they're larger ions. So we can only bind two potassium ions to the three sodium ions and they are binding in the same pocket so they have to fit in the same area. The binding of those potassium ions stimulates dephosphorylation. That is, we're going to remove that phosphoryl group that we added when we bound the sodium ions. Here's our phosphoryl group coming off here as inorganic phosphate. And that dephosphorylation triggers our second conformational change, and now our transporter is going to rock to the other side. The pore is now facing the cytoplasmic side, and we release the two potassium ions. So in this whole reaction cycle, we've hydrolyzed one molecule of ATP, that was our energy source, and we moved three sodium ions outside the cell and two potassium ions inside the cell. Notice that in each case, for both sodium and potassium, we were moving against a gradient. Let's look at that sodium-potassium ATPase a little closer. Here's the ribbon diagram. As you can see, it's mostly alpha helical. Here's the membrane spanning segment here. That's 100% alpha helical. And there in the center are rubidium ions. These were in place when the crystal structure was formed, but this is where the potassium and sodium ions would form or bind. You'll notice there's uh, not much in terms of the extracellular domain here. We only need enough of a pore there so that we can bind and release those ions. We have a much larger cytoplasmic domain, again mostly alpha helical, but some beta sheets there. And this domain is larger because this actually has the enzymatic activity. It carries that aspartate residue, and that's pictured in orange here. That's where we're going to add and remove that phosphoryl group. And remember, that's what toggles the transporter and rocks it from one side to the other. Our next example of active transport is referred to as an ABC transporter, and that stands for ATP binding cassette. So as the name suggests, we're going to use the energy of ATP to move something against a gradient inside the cell, but the mechanism is a little different. These type of transporters are very common in 
bacteria and here we have illustrated an ABC transporter in E. coli. E. coli is a gram-negative cell and so at the top of our pic picture here we have the inner cell membrane here there is an outer cell membrane in all gram-negative bacteria but that's not part of the illustration here and the periplasm is the space between. Our transporter is in green. Our goal is to move a solute molecule, pictured as the red sphere here, inside the cell. However, it's a very small molecule. So in order to affect the transfer, we have a solute binding protein, and that's our blue oval here. It's going to bind the solute, and it's that complex of the solute binding protein and solute that actually binds to the transporter. You can think of the solute binding protein as kind of an escort to take the solute to the right place. So that complex is going to bind to our transporter and that's going to stimulate the ATP binding domains. They're pictured as the yellow ovals here. Those uh, binding domains will bind ATP and hydrolyze it. As you can see, we have two domains, one on either side of our transporter, and so we need to hydrolyze two molecules of ATP. And that will give us the energy we need to open the pore and allow the solute to pass through. You'll notice the channel is only large enough to move the solute through. The solute binding protein stays on the other side of the membrane. You'll also notice in this case, although we use the energy of ATP hydrolysis, we didn't transfer a phosphoryl group, and that makes it distinct from the sodium potassium pump that we both that we looked at in the previous slide. Each of these are examples of primary active transport, but there is something called secondary active transport, and it works on a kind of a piggyback mechanism. In this illustration from your book, the green arrows indicate processes that are energetically favorable, and the red arrows indicate processes that are energetically unfavorable. So if you look at the bottom right, here's our sodium potassium pump that we just looked at. We're moving sodium and potassium in opposite directions, and both are unfavorable, so it costs us ATP hydrolysis to get that accomplished. Now we have a sodium glucose transporter at the top of the screen here. This is the example of secondary active transport. We already set up our sodium gradient. We did that with the sodium potassium pump. And here we're going to use the energy of moving that sodium molecule down uh, its concentration gradient. And that will allow us to transport along with that a glucose molecule against the gradient. Notice that this is a good example of a symporter. Sodium is transported with glucose and both are coming inside the cell. That makes it a symporter. And in each case of either a symporter or an antiporter, one ion or molecule is moving with the gradient, in this case sodium, and the other is moving against the gradient, in this case glucose. Of course, we do have that glucose transporter, and as glucose concentration builds inside the cell, that will spontaneously move down its concentration gradient. In our final video lesson on Chapter 9, we want to see what happens when that action potential reaches the end of an axon. How is the signal communicated from the nerve cell to the adjacent muscle?